Welcome to Health and Veritas. I'm Harlan Krumholtz. And I'm Howie Foreman. We're physicians and professors at Yale University. We're trying to get closer to the truth about health and health care. Our guest today is Dr. Anya Yastrabath. But first, we'd like to check in on current or hot topics in health and health care. And first, Harlan, even before that, I have to say the most exciting thing that happened to me in the last week. What was that, Howie? What was that? Air fryer. Air, air fryer? fryer? Come on. My, my niece is telling me you're to late. Air- you're late to the late to the game here. I am. I know. I realize that. I, you know, I, you know, I, I was. I, I've become my father. I think because my father, it took him until about thirty years ago to get a microwave, and it was at my insistence. And now my my niece has convinced me to get an air fryer. But I feel like it's it's a health related purchase as well because I can now make things without any oil whatsoever. So yeah, but are we sure that I'd share that gonna, our outcomes going to improve? We're going to have to do a trial. Yeah, we'll have to do a trial of air fryers. So anyway, what's on your mind, Harlan? Look, I want to take a, a few minutes just to talk about Apple's, what I think is a big leap, you know, in their healthcare Huge. work. Of course, they've been there for a while with their wearables and the phone and all this stuff, you know, as have, as have other products as well. But, you know, this is pretty amazing. You know, what if your earbuds could do more than play music? What if they could help you hear better, sleep better, and even detect life threatening conditions, you know, and I'm sounding promotional, but like, you know, the idea that the kind of tools that we have that are right around us at sort of affordable price points, as opposed to what it costs for us to get healthcare quality kinds of products, you know, that can actually do things for us health-wise is pretty amazing. So first of all, you know, they, they got FDA approved on a sleep apnea detection on the Apple Watch. So, you know, this is sleep apnea as a condition where, you know, your breathing repeatedly stops and starts during sleep. And it's associated with obesity, a timely. We have Anya uh, on today to talk about obesity and obesity treatment. Uh, affects maybe 30 million people in the U.S. But most people who have it, and it's a risk factor for all sorts of problems, because, of course, if your breathing's stopping and starting, it's causing all sorts of mischief. Most people don't know they have it. And untreated, you know, it can it just continues to progress and cause problems. There are ways to intervene, even drugs now that can reverse it if you treat the obesity. But until now, the diagnosis required expensive, cumbersome sleep studies in the lab or at home tests, costing hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Look, Apple simplified this with a new sleep apnea detection feature for the watch. And, and again, cleared by the FDA. So They're basically using the accelerometer in the watch. That is the function that sort of checks you're moving. This thing is so good that even when you're sleeping and still, it detects your breathing because there's slight micro movements of your body during sleep as you're breathing, of course. And it can alert you if the data shows signs of moderate or severe sleep apnea and suggests that you should follow up with a doc. And it was good enough, like I said, that the FDA uh, has approved it, making sort of the detection of sleep apnea now kind of trivial as opposed to, you know, whole big rigmarole. So that was one thing. And then the other thing was about the, the pods. So that was with the watch and detecting a condition during sleep. The other thing was the pods and, and hearing. So first of all, hearing aids. So, you know, hearing aids is also a big rigmarole. You go get tested, you know, even if you buy over the counter, this thing can cost you a lot of money. More than, again, something like the same number of sleep apnea, 30 million Americans have Hearing loss, and we know this is associated with cognitive decline, dementia, a whole range of things, social isolation, and hearing aids. And I had this with my father-in-law. You know, they can be expensive and, and, and challenging to figure out, you know, what you can use. Here's Apple's solution. You can actually use the pods. You know, it, it's, I think these are, and I'm not, I have no Apple stock. I'm not promoting the company. I'm just impressed by what they're pushing forward on. They, they basically, the $250 AirPods, you know, can be used to apply a hearing test. And then they can use the results of the hearing test to create an, an algorithm that enables these pods to be customized to you to be used as a hearing aid. And that's pretty amazing. This sort of, you know, budget-friendly option is going to enable a lot of people to be able to afford to be able to hear better. But, but not only that, you know, they've, they're also being used for hearing protection. So imagine you're at a concert, you put it in. There's sort of a noise monitoring function that can also help save your hearing and, and help you. And can be used in restaurants also when there's a lot of outside noise. I mean, all this amazing, again, this hearing aid was also approved by the FDA. So 
you know, they went through rigorous testing. They got their approval or authorization uh, in in the case of uh, of uh, the sleep apnea. I think it was authorization through 510K. That's the mechanism by which they're regulating it. But but pretty amazing, Howie. Hey, let's get to our guest. She's terrific, and I think everyone's going to enjoy hearing more about what's going on in the world of obesity. Dr. Anya Yastrovov is the director of the Yale Obesity Research Center, co-director of the Yale Center for Weight Management, and an associate professor of endocrinology at the Yale School of Medicine. In addition to these roles, she is widely recognized as an obesity medicine specialist and an international leader in the research and clinical application of anti-obesity pharmacotherapeutics. Dr. Yastrobov has been the lead author on some of the most important clinical outcome trials of the anti-obesity drugs, including some of the most novel ones. Dr. Yastrobov worked to develop the 2016 Obesity Clinical Practice Guidelines, serves on the board of directors for the American Board of Obesity Medicine, and is a world-recognized expert in this area. Dr. Yastrobov graduated from Bucknell University with her bachelor's degree and received her medical degree from the University of Maryland, where she also completed her internship and residency. She holds a PhD in investigative medicine from Yale University. And this isn't your first uh, go around with us on the podcast. In fact, I went back and looked, and it's almost exactly two years ago that you joined us for the first time. Wait, wait, first first and, I wonder, how did Howie do on your name? Anya yeah. Yastrovov. That's perfect. That, and good. it's it's I, wonderful it's to be one back. Of the most pronounced names on campus. So, you know, I, I'm just. Yeah, no, we're, we, we make a huge effort about names and about pronunciation. In the two years since we had you on the podcast, mm-hmm. These drugs have not just proven to be effective at weight loss and in treating obesity in the various forms, but just have had an explosion in proof of concept for lots of other diseases and reducing risks and so on. How does that change your practice? Because you're, you're not a preventive cardiologist, you're not a nephrologist, um, you're not a psychiatrist, but these drugs do have an impact on lots of different body systems. How does that change the the ecosystem for these these drugs? Yeah, I mean, I think that obesity is really a unique disease for many reasons. And one of them is that if we can effectively treat this one disease, this one neurometabolic disease, we can prevent, mitigate, or treat hundreds of other diseases. And you named some of those diseases. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that we're both treating the disease in and of itself while at the same time doing all of these amazing things. I do think that uh, treating obesity effectively is transformative for medicine, and it's transformative for the exact reasons that you just mentioned. Um, So the transformation that is ongoing right now with these new agents is akin to what we saw with penicillin or what we saw with insulin. They are truly Uh, life-changing, they are truly transformative, and they are, um, in many cases, potentially saving people's lives. Um, uh, They're preventing disease progression. They are improving quality of life. Um, So truly transformative um, therapies now that we have for obesity treatment. And and I'll also add, you know, so I'm an endocrinologist. I focus in on obesity treatment and obesity medicine specifically, but I'm very well aware and I focus on the health gains So when we're treating obesity, it's not about weight loss. It's not about weight reduction. It's about optimizing health and the health gains that our patients experience as we treat their uh, disease. You know, I I wonder, are we really talking just about treating obesity? Because in many of the studies of these medications, the terzepatide and semaglutide or ozempic and and, uh, Mujaro and Zepam and Wegovi, we're seeing health benefits accrue that seem somewhat independent from or not fully explained by weight loss. And there are people in my field who are questioning whether or not these drugs, which have receptors all over the body, you know, in various different places, are having fundamental effects that are independent of their treatment of obesity. So you take, for example, a recent paper that was looking at patients with heart failure, was looking at its effect on inflammation. And the reductions in inflammation in the body were, I don't want to say fully independent of, but were at least partially independent of the amount of weight loss. Now, I know weight loss is an imprecise marker of the treatment of obesity. You know, that's another problem. So it's not necessarily an exact 
proxy for treating obesity. But is it possible that these drugs are effectively treating obesity, which in its own right is an important thing and does account for over 200 diseases, as you've taught me, and, and you know, a wide variety of problems that it can address, but that these drugs may also be having effects that we're yet to fully understand that may be mediated in other ways. What, what's your view on that? Because you've been involved in this from the beginning. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you 100%. And what I would say is, let's use the example of diabetes, for example, right, or the prevention of, of, of diabetes. These medicines, in that case, we know there are direct effects on the islet, right? Um, so they're improving insulin secretion uh, from the beta cells, as well as other things. So there's those direct or proximal effects. There's also effects and, and from that, the that effect on the pancreas. Some people you say islet. Yeah. We're talking about the islet. Yeah, in the pancreas. Yes, and, exactly. And, in the pancreas. And that was one of the earliest things that was appreciated, yes. right? When they isolated the drug from the Gila monster saliva, they were seeing that this has effect on the pancreas. It produced insulin secretion, and that's what yes. led it to be used in diabetes in the first place. Yes, absolutely. And that was that is the you're absolutely right. That is the first thing that was that was noted and found. So those are, you could say, the, the, the direct or the peripheral or the proximal effects on the, the pancreas, the islets, and specifically the beta cells when we're talking about insulin secretion. Um, there are also effects from the weight reduction. So for example, if you lose weight, you are improving insulin sensitivity. So you're improving how your body uses insulin because you're offloading the work that the beta cell has to do or that the islet has to do. So there are both direct effects on the islet, the beta cells, the pancreas, and there are effects from the weight reduction itself in terms of improving how your body is using that insulin that your body needs to make in order to control your blood sugars. So, so I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's both. And so diabetes is one example um, and I know recently, you know, there were many publications um, that were brought forward specifically also looking at the heart. So I think whether it's the heart, the liver, the kidney, where we're seeing these beneficial effects with these medications, diabetes, we could keep on going. There are effects specifically from the drug, whether it's on inflammation or other things. And there are also effects from the weight reduction itself. And the contributions of either one of those may be different for different diseases. So obstructive sleep apnea is yet another disease that we see improvement with trizepatide. So um, so I think it'll be different for different diseases, even and within that, specialties. In that case, are you making the point that you think that might be more about weight loss because of the obstruction versus direct effects? Is, is that what the point you're making? It, it may be, right? It may, it may Although very it may well be. be. Centrally on the brain, and that also may yes, be. Yes, exactly. And let me give another example. So many patients come in with joint pain. Okay, they come in with joint pain. And is that joint pain from, uh, from additional carried mass? Or is it joint pain from inflammation? And what we see, for example, when patients, if they, if they stop a medicine, right, in general, most people start to gain back the weight. Now, the, the pain in their joints may actually return before all the weight does. So that speaks to there's probably another process, not just mass, right? So I think it's it's likely a combination of both factors and, and the degree to which um, uh, weight reduction versus direct effects of these agents themselves play is probably different for different diseases and for different people. Anya, I wanted to ask you, you know, among your many travels and things that you've done, you were on the stage with Oprah. You were on the stage with Oprah. So I, what was that like? I mean, you know, first of all, they're, you know, they were picking who's the best person in the world to talk to Oprah about, you know, these new medications and about the way we're thinking about obesity. And that was you. So uh, what, what was that like? Were you nervous? I mean, what, what was your experience? Um, you know, Oprah is an amazing human. <laughs> and I think that that, that, that that about sums it up. Um, I think that the fact that she is using her platform and her amazing voice to really help shift that culture of shame and blame to one of compassion and care. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing, which is you know why one of the first things I did um, on that stage was to thank her. Because I think that her, for her to share her, her story so vulnerably, 
right? I mean, this, this her story was in front of everyone for years. And then to come out and share it so vulnerably enables others to do the same and, and truly enables us to recognize that this culture of shame and blame for a disease that is not any of our patients' fault, it needs to shift to one of care and compassion and understanding that biology is driving this disease. Biology drives us to, to, to various behaviors, including what we eat, how much we eat, when we eat, what we crave, how hungry we are. And so biology drives this and really understanding that takes that, that, that shame, blame away from our patients and enables us to then be able to care for them. And we as healthcare providers, we are such a critical part of that. We need to understand that and we need to embrace caring for our patients in a completely non-judgmental, compassionate way. Um, and, and she allowed for that on that stage and she continues to. So she's an incredible advocate um, for our patients and just an amazing human being. So it, it, was, a, it was a wonderful experience. You're on the cutting edge of the actual science. And so you've been involved, I think it's more than a year ago, maybe two years ago with the trial and retatratide. But I'm wondering when you look out on the landscape, not guessing games, but based on what you know, what are sort of the big, exciting things that people can look forward to in terms of oral versus injectable, in terms of more effective, less side effects and so on? What do you think is happening in the next few years based on what you know? Um, so many, many exciting things to come. And I think we're at the tip of the iceberg. Um, so also I'll, I'll say that first. Um, so yes, so the, so, uh, semaglutide, um, that pivotal trial was in 2021. Trizepatide, um, one of the studies that I led, um, uh, the pivotal trial was in 2022 for obesity treatment. And as you mentioned, retitrutide, which is a, uh, triple hormone receptor agonist for GIP, GLP-1 and glucagon, uh, that the phase two, uh, came out in 2023. There are other medications, servutatide, which is a GLP-1 glucagon receptor agonist. There are orals in development, like orforglipron, which is a small molecule, so it's a once daily, and there are other small molecules in development. Oral semaglutide is already FDA approved for diabetes and being looked at for obesity treatment, also oral daily. Um, there's also a monthly injectable called Maritide. Um, and so imagine taking a medication uh, once a month, self-injectable once a month or, or even less, and, and being able to, to treat your obesity as well as as, you know, potentially uh, uh, prevent, mitigate, or treat 200 other diseases. So that all is coming, and that is under the umbrella of these um, nutrient-stimulated hormone-based therapies. They're all uh, based on these hormones that we that are stimulated when we eat, okay? Now, that is one class of anti-obesity medications. There are others in development. Oh, and I forgot to mention, there's another one, Cagri Sema. Um, so there are amylin analogs that are also in development, and, and Cagri Sema Cagrilantide is an amylin analog. So that's probably going to be the next to read out in the next few months. And then and then hit the market sometime thereafter. So I think those are from that class. That's the next one. But there are other classes in development. So there are um, myostatin um, activin receptor inhibitors or or pathway um, uh, agents that impact that pathway, and those are um, agents that actually can increase or at least maintain lean mass while decreasing fat mass. Um, so those are yet to, you know, to, to be sorted out in terms of, of, of how they will work, but myostatin active and pathway inhibitor. So look out for that class potentially coming to a forefront. And that's partly because we are concerned that some of these drugs might reduce muscle mass while patients are losing adiposity, right? Well, any, any form, any form of obesity treatment or weight reduction, which I separate the two, obesity treatment is not weight reduction alone, um, will you will lose lean mass. So if you have bariatric surgery, if you undergo bariatric surgery, you will lose lean mass in addition to fat mass. If you take these medications, you will lose both. If you eat less, right, you, you will lose both. 
So it's it's the ratio that we're looking at. And it doesn't look to, to be that there is a market difference. And so the question is, well, are there things we could do to maintain? Well, exercise, right, is is one of those ways. Or eating uh, nutritious food is another way. Or, or some people, you know, increase the amount of protein that they eat or things like that, right? But it's really the, the quality of the nutritious food and the exercise. But are there other ways that we could do this? And so one of the potential uh, questions is, can these new new uh, class of medications potentially do this? Um, pairing them at the same time. Now, you could pair those new class of medications at the time that you undergo bariatric surgery, right? Or at the time that you start one of these uh, medications like semaglutide or trisepatide. That's the question. But importantly in that, it's not just the amount of muscle or the amount of lean mass. It's the quality and the function. So we have to not only assess how much lean mass or muscle mass someone has, but how well it works. And, and I think that's, that's where we're moving to next with, with a lot of these agents and, and trials. And so those are two examples of classes, right? So we're the farthest along with the nutrient-stimulated hormone, uh, hormone-based class. That's the farthest along. Then the myostatin active and pathway inhibitors, they're somewhere, some of them are in phase two. Um, and, and moving forward, and there'll be an important trial that reads out with, with one of those agents, bimagramab, that'll read out um, sometime in the next few months as well. Hopefully, we'll have to see. Um, so so there, are, there are many things that are, that are coming to a forefront. There are other pathways. There are other mechanisms that are being explored. So these are just two. Um, so that's why literally I'm saying this is just the tip of the iceberg, and, and, and we have so much more to come. Yeah. You know, there are more than more than fifty compounds that are already moving along, and it's going to be amazing. I wanted to ask you this. I know we're we're kind of let's just stretch the time, Howie. She's so good, just a little bit. The uh, so you've been traveling around the world. You were in Seoul, Madrid. You know, you 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 you've been a wonderful ambassador. Can you just tell us? So, what are you hearing around the world? I mean, we kind of see what's going on in the U.S., but what's going on elsewhere? How are docs thinking about this? How are health systems coping with the costs? You're, you're talking in many countries where they've got a single payer. I mean, what are, you, what are you learning as you're going around the world? Are there places that are resistant to this idea of obesity as a disease and treatment, or, or is everyone on board? What, what are you seeing? I, I think everybody is amazed um, and really open to this transformative time. And I always say, you know, with everything, we have to proceed cautiously, carefully. We have to look at long-term outcomes. And again, for diabetes treatment, GLP-1 receptor agonists have been around for over 20 years. The, each of these new uh, you know, hormone pathways that is being targeted, they haven't been around as long. So we have to do our due diligence. We have to be careful and, and we have to look at outcomes. Nothing is ever all good. But, but again, so far with these medications, it looks like there's so many transformative beneficial effects. Um, so I think in most places, there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of buildup. There's a lot of waiting, right? Because sometimes the medicine could be approved. For example, in Korea, semaglutide and trisepatide are approved, but they don't have them yet. So they don't, um, they don't have them? They don't have them yet. So so there are instances like that, right? Whereas, um, you know, in various countries, are they other countries. In, does China have them available? Um, I don't know. I do I, don't know that it, not, it's not being equally anyway, distributed around the globe at this point. Well, I and 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 again, I think um, the other question to, to the other question in terms of um, countries that have single payer systems and other ways of of covering them. I was in Australia, I guess it was a year and a half ago, and they had semaglutide, and it was somewhere around I don't know thirty five dollars a month, and in the UK it was a hundred dollars a month. So there are definitely you know market differences in terms of the cost. But also in terms of access, so are the medicines being de uh, delivered in a, um, a single dose injector, like we have with uh, the version, the, the the obesity versions of semaglutide and trisepatide in the United States versus multi dose pens, um, which which are m much better in terms of um, treatment and being able to titrate the dose to what the patient mm -hmm. needs in terms of decreasing the dose if they're having side effects or increasing if they need more more of a dose, um, but, but which gets... This is, gets there's so much I want to add. Let me just get this one in then. Yeah. What do you think about Lily distributing vials instead of the pens? Because I heard that they are going to start doing that. So they so there's a release of or they 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 announced this just recently that for the 2.5 and the five milligram dose of trisepatide they'll have single dose vials um, that uh, uh, if somebody doesn't have insurance coverage they can be purchased 
Um, and uh, so, so that is coming online. I think it's just becoming available. That means available people will now. do it like they do insulin. They'll be pull. I mean, they used to yeah. do insulin a long time ago, which is they'll yeah. be pulling it's still it out. Like, yeah, you could still do that. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. So, so they would just have an an insulin, a syringe, uh, not insulin, but a syringe and a vial. Um, but it's single dose. Um, right. and yeah, and and part of that is, you know, if we think about it for you know, we want to ensure that people and patients are safe, right? So that they have the appropriate dose at the appropriate time. Um, and so, so anyway, so, so they are releasing that um, as an alternative. Is that because they have a shortage of the pens themselves? So this is addressing the shortage of the pens? Well, I don't know the inner workings, right, of, of those types of decisions. I do know that there is difficulty in terms of getting medicine into the single dose injectors, because that's an additional right? That's an additional step, an additional cost. So I think overall, the multi-dose injector pens are really uh, the, that, you know, that is where we should be moving if, if we're not already, because then again, it's easy for the patient to, to uh, have it with them, to take it with them wherever they're going, um, uh, even though it's once weekly, right? Um, everybody's not always in one one location at, at a certain period of time. They can easily titrate the dose. We we do, and again, this is off label, but we can use clicks to really uh, be able to titrate the dose to exactly what the patient needs, and and it's just um, a, a good way to deliver the medication. So I think multi dose pens is is really the optimal way to deliver these. But that does take that additional step of transferring that uh, medication into those multi-dose pens. Yeah. This is amazing. You are a jewel and we are so lucky to have you. And uh, I wanted to just have an open invitation that you can come back anytime you want, if you have the time, because we always learn from you. So thank you very much. Great. I'll, I'll come back. I'll come back. Howie's just saying, if you want to take my place on the podcast, that's <laughs> that too. That too. <laughs> I'd be happy to come back for visit number three. Thank you for having me for visit number two. Thank you. Well, that that was terrific as usual, Howie. She's she's great. A rock star. She's just a rock star. But now, da, 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 Howie, what's on your mind this week? So you know, polio is back in the news again. Over two years ago on the podcast, we talked about a serious polio threat in the New York area when one person developed paralytic polio and wastewater detected the virus in several adjoining and nearby counties. Less than 1% of all infections with polio virus result in paralytic polio. So when we see wastewater evidence of polio, we know people are being infected, but generally only when we see actual clinical poliomyelitis, paralytic polio, do we know precisely who was infected. So that outbreak extinguished itself without more harm, good news. But throughout the world, we have continued to see vaccine-related, vaccine-derived polio outbreaks, which is one of the main reasons why richer nations, including our own, have shifted to a different vaccine, an inactivated polio vaccine. And we talked about this earlier. But these vaccines can only be very effective at extremely high uptake rates and when polio is nearly eradicated. And I'll refer our listeners back to episode 45 to understand more of that nuance. But in brief, oral polio vaccine, that's the one that Harlan and I took, but for which the country now does not take, but the rest of the world does. That is the vaccine of choice for the Global Polio Eradication Initiative because it provides superior mucosal immunity, that's in our uh, GI tract, against subsequent infection and spread of the wild polio virus. It spreads from vaccinees, those who have been vaccinated, to close contacts and thus immunizes some individuals that were not reached by the vaccination program. It can be rapidly administered by volunteers in the form of little oral drops, and it's relatively affordable by an order of like 10 to 1. But today, I'm not talking about a vaccine-derived polio outbreak. And for those that may be interested, there was an outbreak in the Gaza Strip recently, and I did a TikTok, which we can link on, on our show notes today about that one. But for the first time in several years, we have a worsening outbreak of wild type, the original polio, in Pakistan. Wild-type polio has been on the cusp of eradication except for one major region in the world, that being Pakistan and Afghanistan. But even here, there has been enormous progress with fewer than two dozen cases for several years running. But even that progress is being partially undone now. In Islamabad, the capital of Pakistan where over one million people live, a single case has been detected 
and wastewater detection has been there and in many other regions in Pakistan right now. In Afghanistan, many more cases are circulating, including vaccine-related cases. So both wild-type and vaccine-related cases can be eradicated through high penetration of vaccination, but that's where the problem begins. There are many reasons why the people of Pakistan have seen declining rates of immunization, but one of them relates to the U.S. government's effort to find Osama bin Laden. They were using a fake vaccination program to identify bin Laden's location. And in 2014, the U.S. government acknowledged this and promised not to do this again, but the damage was done. There are obviously many more reasons for individuals to become skeptical, but this one really stings. And this week, as if to make matters worse, the Taliban, the de facto ruling entity of of Afghanistan, banned most of their polio vaccination programs. This, too, is a very concerning move. If we're going to have successful vaccination programs, whether we're talking about the U.S., Pakistan, or Afghanistan, we need to make certain that politics are minimized and the public's questions are answered early and often. So for the moment, Pakistan is engaging in a truly massive vaccination campaign as the rest of the world watches and hopes for a quick reversal to the current outbreak. But Afghanistan has paused in many efforts with worsening data as well. So we can eradicate polio. We really have the means to do this, but it requires global cooperation and not one nation, not a few nations, but all nations have to decide they're going to make this uh, work together you know, if we're going to be successful. You know, how it's a real tragedy, to, you know, for anyone to be affected by this disease when we really have the, within our reach to be able to prevent it. And, and disheartening that we just can't eliminate it because it really should be something. It's a, really a political problem more than it is a medical it is. public health problem. Just since you're talking about it, I wonder if if you're prepared to say anything about what's going on in Gaza, because, you know, was there an outbreak in Gaza? I mean, what was it that led this to say it was an imperative to to vaccinate in Gaza? So for those that want to see more, we'll link in the notes the TikTok. But one case uh, was one paralytic polio case was in Gaza, much like we had one case in the United States last year. It was of an Egyptian uh, strain. It was a strain that was linked to Egypt, where there is ongoing small numbers of vaccine-derived polio. And so the World Health Organization, in collaboration with a lot of countries, swooped into Gaza, which is a war zone, uh, and was able to do a massive vaccination campaign. And they're going to go back there two more times to complete that campaign and hopefully eradicate this before it spreads to more. But they are still at risk uh, in the same way other countries have been over time. But they had gone 25 years without a case. You know, I thought that was a a case of, you know, in the midst of war, it's in disease knows no borders. And so it's in everyone's interest to to work together to make sure that this doesn't come out. You know, they can't agree on anything, but they did agree on this vaccination program. I mean, basically, it's hard for them to agree on things, but this is something I I thought it was. Yeah, it was really too important for them to to, if we can only get them together on other things, too, it would be good. But uh, But thank you, Howie. Great update. Great update. You've been listening to Health and Veritas with Harlan Krumholtz and Howie Foreman. So how did we do? To give us your feedback or to keep the conversation going, you can email us at health.veritas at yale.edu or follow us on LinkedIn, Threads, or Twitter. And we always want to hear your feedback or questions that you have or, or any experiences you have that may relate to things we've talked about on the show. If you like us or even if you don't like us, rate us and review us. It helps other people find us. And we, we really appreciate it. Yeah. If you have questions about the MBA for Executives program at the Yale School of Management, reach out via email for more information or check out our website at som.yale.edu slash EMBA. You know, Howie, I, I want to tell you that um, well, I'd like to encourage people. We really like it when people come up to us and say they listen to the podcast. I was at a conference this morning and uh, just out of the blue, someone came up to me and said how much they enjoy listening to you and in the podcast. And uh Anyway, just encourage you. Go ahead. We've had Go ahead. some nice exchanges with our listeners by email as well. You and I had a nice uh, exchange with a, a, a man with, that had been emailing us over the last couple of years. And so we're happy to take thoughtful contributions and give give back to you and try to incorporate it in the podcast in the future. Yeah, that's great. Health and Veritas is produced at the Yale School of Management, Yale School of Public Health. Thanks to our researchers, and is Jill and Sophia Stone, and to our producer, Miranda Schaefer. Talk to you soon, Howie. They are awesome. Thank you very much, Ron. Talk to you soon.